One, two, three. Hello, welcome to Rock the Cash Bar. I'm Ben Mowbray. And I'm Diane Gallagher. Every week we pick one song and do a deep dive into the lyrics and explain the different ways they've been interpreted. We will also discuss how the song connected to us on a personal level, focusing on all the embarrassing details. Glad to have you here. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Cash Bar. Welcome to our third anniversary. It's been three years, Diane. How are you feeling? Uh, I can't believe it. I can't believe we're still doing it. Um, mainly because I'm very pushy and I have a type A personality and I won't let it go. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> we brought a professional radio man on to celebrate with us. Our guest today is former NFL football player and current radio host, Seth Payne. Seth, thanks for being here today. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm flattered and thrilled to be here. Thank you. So I'm flattered. I'm, I'm actually I'm thrilled to have you. I listen to your radio show all the time. I, I used to I used to be a construction supervisor. I would drive around from site to site and I would listen to you guys all day, every day. Oh, good. I hope I made you inefficient. And, uh, yeah. I always, and my favorite thing is whenever somebody says like, ah, I was late for a meeting because I had to listen to the rest of the segment. <laughs> In my case, I was always like listening. I wish Seth Payne was here to help me unload all this fucking plywood. You know, <laughs> better at this than I am. <laughs> nice. Um, How are you? Where are you? Um, I am just like in my home studio, like which is which is I've had like seven different backgrounds. And I was just turned into uh, I've got a velvet curtain behind me, and I'm gonna leave it at that. I just uh, okay. I'm a guy, you know, like Ben. Our um, our listeners, like on the radio show, it's like 97 percent men, ages 25 to 54, and I realized that like any set design or anything for anything I do is largely just like to. To satisfy somebody that probably doesn't give a damn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's just going to come in for ridiculous criticism anyway. What's that painting behind you? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't need any more fodder. It's, it's yeah. all fodder for, for guys to, to pick on other guys. Yeah. It's really funny. Yeah, one day was pick, pick it on me. He was like, do you live in a T-Mobile store? I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny, your listeners are mostly male. Um, my Our friend Sarah Talamash, she's a comedian and she has a podcast called Lady Journey where they just talk about the ridiculous journeys us ladies go on with like makeup and all this stuff. And they keep checking and most of their listeners are men. <laughs> really? <laughs> and I was That's like, I think they're just trying to understand us. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty cool though. That's a, yeah, the, the the stats that you can get on social media are really fascinating because for one, they kind of like, they blow your mind in terms of what, your vision of yourself is and who you appeal to and everything. Like, I always thought maybe I had more of an appeal just like, you know, to, to women just for the stuff we talk about and everything. And on the radio, I think it's like 92% male. Um, but like on YouTube, on YouTube, I do like all football. Yeah. And it's like, it's like 99% male. Yeah. Um, the other thing though, too, is like, it's kind of humbling when you can see like what percentage of people actually listen all the way through. And, and I just like, I always wonder back, like if you go back to Tolstoy, if Tolstoy could know how few people actually finish his novels, like would he have dialed it back a little bit? <laughs> it hurts my feelings. I try not to look at our YouTube when I'm like, so I lost you real quick, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, but you know what though? That's the thing though. If you think about it, at least this is what works for me. It's like, okay, wow like 33% of people like listen to me for that long. Yeah. Like that's the core. So I try to almost look at like, okay, how many diehard people do I have? And not even look at the top line number. Like the, the people who listen all the way through are the, like, that's the profit. Like, okay, those are the people that are going to be with you for a long time. I love finding out people who are diehards who I thought would never listen. Like I'll run into someone randomly from even like high school and they're like, I caught this episode. And, and I'm like, you listen every week to the whole thing. Like that. Yeah. Thank Do you get you. nervous then? Are you kind of like, then you start thinking about everything you've said? Oh, I get sometimes. nervous and apologetic. I'm always just like, I'm sorry I put you through that. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I go free form on this and I'll say things I'm like, as I'm saying it, I'm like, I shouldn't be, I don't want my neighbor hearing me say this. Hi, Jenna. Uh, but yeah. then she's like, I listen to your podcast. And I'm always like, oh no, which one? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, there's so many people. There's so many people that you might never like disclose things to at a dinner party, yeah. who are just feel exactly the same way as you about exactly. things. They have the same insecurities and everything. It's really cool. 
Yeah. We did a, an episode that was heavy on like stripper and sex work content. And Ben from the get go was like, mom, turn it off. (laughs) (laughs) Right now. Don't even attempt it. Don't pass go. I was having uh, dinner with a couple of friends that I hadn't seen much of like since the pandemic. And they were both telling me just like, we feel like we've known you like for the past three years because we listened to to every single episode. So we don't feel like we missed it. Like, well, Oh, right. <laughs> that, feels like that puts them at kind of a, uh, an advantage over you. Like they've been yeah. spying on you and you've got no spy plane footage whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like you guys need to be putting out some of your, your emotional investments. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or at least <laughs> like I'm the only one working in this relationship. <laughs> yeah, well, to all my you- listeners, I would like some feedback. You know, email us more. Tell us what you're liking and not liking. Don't just spur it on us three hours later over a drink. <laughs> I mean, three well, years. Well, let's do it. Seth, yeah. you picked uh, meatloaf. We hadn't done an episode with meatloaf yet. Yeah. What, <laughs> what made you pick meatloaf? Like, I'm gonna... I, I actually, uh, Diane had tweeted something about one of the songs you guys were doing, or maybe you just tweeted something about music in general. I can't remember. And I thought, and I, and I, and I, at the time, I was reading a book about negotiating. And like listening uh, on my, I just picked like a, a, some songs that had a certain beat per minute because I was working out on my stationary bike. And that's how I like to try to just get into a zone is listen to like, okay, today's like an 80 BM, BPM type of day. Um, so I don't remember what BPM Paradise by the Dashboard Light is, but it popped on as I'm also like, it just finished reading this book about negotiating. And like, I, I'm listening to the lyrics and I guess I never realized just like what, what a <laughs> hardcore negotiation was going on there. And eight then minutes. I got, <laughs> yeah, eight minutes. The original version was 11. And um, so there was that. And then there was also, it, it you know, over the last couple of years, like all, people have started realizing some of this stuff from the 80s. And this this song was 1978, um, like 80s movies, like uh, like any John Hughes movie, basically, or 16 Candles. Um, Revenge of the Nerds. There's some like heavy duty, very, very inappropriate, like basically date rape type of stuff. It's just passed off as kind of as a joke, you know? So, so I'm listening to this, the lyrics on the song and I'm like, oh man, all right. I think this thing survived. Like, I think it's, this seems like a, I think I'd love to hear Diane's perspective on it, but like, I feel like these, he was respecting her boundaries and uh, they end up, but it's a horrible negotiation for the both of them. Yeah, we'll we'll get to all that. It's it's yeah. hilarious. I didn't know this is a three act play. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> it's very it's a Broadway play. Like and that was one that, like Meatloaf was very theatrical and I didn't yeah, there's a lot of stuff about this song that was interesting. Yeah. I didn't realize how much of a Broadway guy he was. Like in his early career, like he's literally a Broadway performer. Like that was he wasn't a rock star. He was a theater guy. Oh, I never would have guessed that. <laughs> yeah, and it makes it's kind of um there's almost like a little bit of a queen vibe in that they're just trying to they're trying to be grandiose and go places that normally rock doesn't go and combine a lot. It was um it was, it was I always thought it was kind of a goofy frivolous song, but that there's it's it's way more interesting than I thought it was. Well, it is. It's supposed to be silly when reading about yeah. this and the way he's so overboard on stage and I was watching the video and I was like, "Why is this familiar?" And then I was like, it's Jack Black. That's what it, this is why we oh, have Jack, yeah. Jack Black. Yeah. It's so Jack Black could easily, you could take Meatloaf out and put Jack Black in and like just do the same thing and it would work. Yeah, you can definitely see where the Meatloaf character informed like the Jack Black character. And Meatloaf was cast as Jack Black's dad in uh, in the uh, in the Tenacious D movie. Oh, yeah. oh my God, I didn't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> it makes total sense. I but was watching it. And I was like, this is if Chris Farley and Jack Black had a baby. I mean, it's the same <laughs> like energy and silliness, <laughs> but one could I say. The, I, I first found out about Meatloaf in like 1993 when Bad Out of Hell 2 came out. And it yeah. was just like, it was like, it was like a drunk uncle had just like come home from a cult. You know, it's just like, like all of a sudden it was like all over MTV. It's like, who the hell is this? Like my mom and dad had to, well, that's your uncle Meatloaf. <laughs> Which you know, and and he's back. been doing. He's been touring this whole time. Like he, went, <laughs> he had this hit, this album in 1978, never did anything except was touring, touring, touring. And then 1993 was my senior year in high school. And I think that's another reason the song kind of hit when the um, I Do Anything for Love but yeah. I won't do that came yeah. out. It was like, then you learn about the other songs. It was, a, yeah, he's a, just a very unique presence in American pop yeah. music. 
And it was like a movie. Like, like that was the first video I, of his I saw was I would do anything for love. Of course, it's it's what like twelve or thirteen minutes long. <laughs> yeah. It basically looks like an episode. You remember the old Beauty and the Beast uh, TV series that was on the air around that time with, uh, with yeah. what's his name, Old Boy is the Beast. Uh -huh. like, that's yeah. what it reminded me of. I was like, "Why this guy doesn't make songs? He writes movies that are musical. Like he's right. it's a minute movie." And you know, he also like it, it kind of in a Jack Black type of way. I've always been really impressed with guys that are like you know, not classically uh, handsome and yeah. overweight. And remember, Meatloaf was overweight, like by 1978 standards. Like, yeah. so like you look at him now and you're like, ah, he's not that bad. 1978, that was really big. But he's like got the confidence to pull it off. You know, mm -hmm. like that takes a whole lot of puts, but uh, to just pull all that off and not give a damn. It's uh, I've always it's it's he's an interesting guy. Yeah, it's eventually like, you'll never see a rock star that looks like Meatloaf ever again. Like you just you just won't have a guy who isn't visually appealing on stage ever. Yeah. Yeah. Like, those days are over. Yeah. Yeah. My first Meatloaf experience was Rocky Horror Picture Show. And uh, <laughs> which he, he which he negotiated because like to, as a promotion, right? Like to, to run that before the movie. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, this, yeah. All right, uh, these lyrics are so long. Uh, we probably <laughs> skimmed some of it, but yeah, I think we should probably get into this. I'll shut up. We're skipping through some chords. All right, so this this song is, like, like, like Seth says, it's a negotiating tactic, it's a duet, all right? So the boy opens with... Well, I remember every little thing as if it happened only yesterday Walking by the lake and there was not another car inside Well, I remember every little thing as if it happened only yesterday parking by the lake and there was not another car in sight. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let me ask both of you. I've been knows my answer. Um, have you guys had the car sex? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I never <laughs> have. It's crazy. <laughs> it's like when you play never, ever have I ever, I'm all, that's my one that gets everyone's fingers down. But my, I'm like, I've never, it never appealed to me. <laughs> have you ever attempted you car sex? Or? Or? I never even attempted. Like I was just like, I'd rather go lay in the dirt. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if like there were just no more buckets or like the, you know, the seats, the long seats like we had in the early 80s. But I mean, and I'm five foot and flexible and I still was like, this sounds like it's gonna hurt. <laughs> like, I don't, uh, I don't want to do this. So you never had, you never had car sex in your teen years. But I mean, I don't mean to pry or be too personal, but I mean, come on. In the I'm DeLorean, you had I never did it in the DeLorean. You had a DeLorean, and you never did it in the DeLorean. <laughs> Sat in a DeLorean? I can't even fit in there comfortably. It's the worst car. <laughs> that's the whole thing, though. But that's like airplane sex. It's not. It's not the pleasure you're after. It's just okay. the. Uh, it's the. Yeah. It's the, the stories afterwards. Yeah. Exactly. Just, I, you know, I drove a two door Pontiac Le Mans in high school. Um, well, first it was a, I, I drove a Mazda GLC and then I graduated to a two door Pontiac Le Mans, like in the, um, in like Le Mans, like not the old, like muscle car Le Mans, Le Mans when it turned into a, a castrated version of whatever it had been. <laughs> and, uh, I remember I, I, we, we tried my high school girlfriend and I tried and it ended up being more Diane's preferred method, the outdoor method. Cause it was just, too, <laughs> but it's cold where I grew up. It was like, it was like five degrees out. You're from New York. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah yeah so it was uh, but i grew up in the country so it was always easy to find some that's i think that's another part of it too it's like if you if you live in the city or the suburbs it's not so simple to just go park somewhere and expect to have any kind of privacy i honestly think i'd be more comfortable in the trunk <laughs> like the come on <laughs> <laughs> we can lay down a little bit at least such a creepy fantasy I <laughs> i'm prissy <laughs> <laughs> all right let's keep going and i never had a girl looking any better than you did and all the kids at school they were wishing they were me that night <laughs> and i never had a girl looking any better than you did and all the kids at school were wishing they were me that night yeah yeah buddy that's a real dude thought that happens that we don't talk about very much because it's awful but yeah like how many times are you like are you with a, a lover and you're just like yeah everybody wishes they were me right now <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna talk about this to everybody. <laughs> if you're gonna, that should be what he says later. Don't worry, I'm gonna tell everybody about it. <laughs> I'm gonna totally embellish my part. <laughs> well, this is funny. This brings up a text I was having with Seth beforehand. Um, 
you had sent me the photo to use for the promo and you're like, it's only five years old. And I, <laughs> and it, remain, it reminded me that um, in Corbin's garage, there was a my high school senior photo up. And I was always like, okay, this is getting creepy. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. and you, you tell me what you said. Well, I did the same. I ran across a photo that my mother-in-law had sent us of, uh, of Brandy, my wife, when she was like, a, I guess she was a freshman in college, okay. you know, young yeah. and uh, like I'm 48. And so I, I, I kind of caught myself because I wanted to compliment how pretty she was, but I also didn't want to a sound like was <laughs> yeah and b yeah like yeah exactly like boy this is a lot different than now wow. <laughs> Yeah, you're saying I don't know how to compliment her. And I was like, tread lightly, my friend. Uh, I think the only way you can do it is to be like, you're almost as pretty then as you are now. That's, almost, yeah, that's yeah. it. That's all you can say. Uh, the other part of it, too, is the, the creepy part, too, is when you start thinking about like, OK, I'm just recounting my high school experience with that. I'm like, oh, OK, that was with a 17 year old at the time. I better <laughs> dial back the like. I gotta, I gotta, <laughs> I'm gonna age this photo in my mind a little bit so I don't feel weird about it. Yep. Get my expectations back in perspective. Yes. And now I bought us all who's so close and tight. It never felt so good, it never felt so right. And we're blowing like the man on the edge of a knife. And now our bodies are oh so close and tight. It never felt so good. It never felt so right. And we're glowing like the metal on the edge of a knife. Yeah. Let's glowing talk like about that metal. line because it comes up a lot because even they know they said it and they were like, I don't really know what that means. Oh, it's really? Oh, they didn't. Uh, they're just like, uh, they, they don't mean, they just came up with it. It's like Bob Dylan explaining his lyrics. So like, I don't know what it means. It just sounded yeah. right. Sounds good. I think they did put some thought into it because it does work so well. Like, like you are glowing like the metal on the edge of a knife, like on the face of it, it works there. But also like this couple is really walking a knife's edge. Through, yeah. like, like said, it's a negotiation. Like they're definitely, they're okay. definitely treading pretty lightly here. And it is, yeah, glowing like the metal on the edge of a knife. There's like something about like when you're like when you're having your first experiences and when you're a teenager, it's like, it feels like big stuff you know like holy crap like i'm a i'm on the precipice of something here and you're like you're 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 breaking into cutting into new territory um like that's a I, yeah that one resonated with me i didn't know if that was i thought it was a good metaphor without even being able to like explain the metaphor yeah. um but i was i suspected that it also might be cheesy and i just don't recognize cheesy yeah, I also think that Meatloaf probably has knives on his mind because his father tried to kill him with one when he was a teenager. Really? Yeah, that was how. So Meatloaf's, and again, I, I just did this research this week. So this is, but Meatloaf's mother died when he was nineteen of uh, of cancer. His father was a was an alcoholic and a pretty bad one. You know, like he would he would go on you know benders and disappear for days at a time. And Meatloaf and his mother would drive around from bar to bar trying to find him. His dad was a drunken cop. Um, after his mother passed, obviously the responsibility for taking care of 19 year old meatloaf is now on this drunk dad. And I guess he decided one night that he'd had enough of it. So he just burst into meatloaf's room with a knife and meatloaf, according to meatloaf, he rolled out of the way just in time as his dad plunged the knife into the mattress. And so meatloaf runs out of the house, like in his pajama bottoms and never went back. Wow. Holy uh, shit. Did he ever, uh, like, did he, did his dad ever straighten out or anything or? I don't know if they ever reconciled or, or I never read anything that said that they ever spoke to each other again. Like uh, there's wow. just, no, the last, my dad story I heard from Meatloaf. Yeah. Man. I don't know if dad's coming back like, Hey, things got yeah. out of hand then. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what, like part of it too though. Okay. Since if you, cause I mean, where this song goes, they're playing the doo-wop music in the background and everything. And it feels a little bit like, okay, it's not just 1978. This is like, a scene from 1968 or something or 58 yeah. right? before birth control before anything before you're allowed to get divorced so if you knock somebody up yeah that was it you're yeah. you're getting married for the rest of your life yeah the stakes are very high back then and i what i love about this is and i was i checked the research it is supposed to be about like they're both going to lose their virginity and that's why they're pumping up like how great i mean it's called paradise by the dashboard yeah I'm like, mm -hmm. it's so cute how good you think this is going to go. <laughs> 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 Your first time in a car. Yes, it's going to be like, la, 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 la. I mean, it's just, 
It's it called Paradise by the Dashboard Light and not a brief embarrassment by the Dashboard Light. <laughs> and that, and like a, oh, I'm like sorry. A oh, the dashboard light. <laughs> <laughs> Disappointing no, no young lady by the Dashboard Light. <laughs> Glowing like the metal on the edge of a knife. Come on, hold tight. Well, come on, hold tight. Though it's cold and lonely in the deep, dark night, I can see paradise by the dashboard light. Yes. Yeah. So with um, at what point in there did, was it Ellen Foley? Ellen Foley mm -hmm. was the vocals. Did she, she was in at least part of that first, uh, yes. that actually, first stanza, right? I actually have it in red where she's singing. Um, okay. Just that one line, though it's cold, uh, is it thoughts or th though it's cold and lonely in the deep dark, dark night is her and then this next verse is her oh yeah. okay okay yeah that's where it's kind of um like and then the video too is interesting because she's playing well it, it's a different woman in the video carla devito but um that's where like the theatrical part of it really comes in when she gets into it and you can see because that's where like you can see okay they're both like you said they're both totally into this and in the moment and and and, and ready at this point yeah mm -hmm. it seems okay this song is so teenage sexy because like it starts off like like, like what's it, it starts off so so you know lively and then it just gets more so <laughs> like like it, like it starts off at such high tension and it and it ratchets up from there. Yeah, it's gonna yeah, start but, getting hot and heavy. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you know that's a good point. Like just how everything is so big when you're a teenager too. Like it's uh, everything's got to be monumental because it is the first time. It feel that's what the song feels like. It yep. feels like an yeah. appropriately big moment. Yes, and they are, you get it delivered because, like you were saying earlier, it does kind of have that like like 1950s sort of like American bandstand feel to it. You know, like yeah. here it is in the middle of like the grimy heavy metal 70s, and somehow it's still got that throwback to all right, keep three three feet of space for the Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> I like to hear Dick Clark narrating it. Yeah. <laughs> No doubt about it, we were doubly blessed because we were barely 17 and we were barely dressed. Ah, oh, sweetness. Right. They both sing it. Ain't no doubt about it. Baby got to go out and shout it. Ain't no doubt about it. We were doubly blessed. Yeah, horny chorus. <laughs> <laughs> we were um, barely 17 and we were barely dressed. So there's here, here comes the boy with a little more romance. Baby, don't you hear my heart? You gotta drown it out the radio. I've been waiting so long for you to come along. Baby, don't you hear my heart? You got it drowning out the radio. I've been waiting for so long for you to come along and have some fun. Well, I gotta let you know. No, you're never gonna regret it. So open your eyes. I got a big surprise. It'll feel all right. Ooh, that's where I felt like it started getting cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> You're out of your skis, man. Don't be making yeah. promises beforehand. <laughs> exactly. Say that all the time. Don't make promises you can't keep, son. <laughs> I can go all night. Yeah. No, I can't. <laughs> yeah. That's actually, the, that, it's funny because, um, yeah, baby, don't you hear my heart? You got it drowning out the radio. That part, it didn't really even, uh, I, that part didn't resonate until until you read, read it. But like, I've been waiting so long for you to come along and have some fun. Yeah, especially if you go back to like, I, well, yeah, anything in high school, like that, that amount of waiting that where you've been going out with somebody for like two months and it feels like seven years yes. and yeah. you've like steadily progressed into various stages of whatever you're doing. And, uh, yeah. you know, it, whether this is prom night or whatever it is, it's um, it, it's a long time building up to it. Yeah, yeah. this isn't the first date. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah she's no hussy. 
<laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely not. He's been working on this for months. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to make your motor run. And now our bodies are oh so close and tight. It never felt so good. It never felt so right. And we're glowing like the metal on the edge of a knife. Glowing like the metal on the edge of a knife. All right. That's the, uh, we'll don't have, we don't have to read that course again. <laughs> it just it keeps going and going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to get to the second act with uh, Yankees announcer Phil. How do you say his last name? Rizzuto? Rizzuto. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this yes. cracked me up. I was not ready for this. <laughs> oh, did you not remember this part of it? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Yeah. It's okay. so good. And you know what's funny is I was like, oh, they must have found this perfect clip that already existed in a game and put it in. And they did not. They they scripted this for this song, which was yeah, really cool. So Rizzuto actually recorded it? Yeah. Really? So there's a funny story behind it. He recorded it. And then when the song came out, apparently he's re really religious and his priest kind of scolded him for it, for this very sexual innuendo metaphor. And he tried to lie and be like, I didn't know that that's what they were going to use it for. <laughs> <laughs> and Meatloaf was like, yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's, um, that's funny because especially like in the 70s, I've been reading a lot about the 70s and various, you know, things going on with social movements back then was that kind of intermingling of, people that you would never guess like P Diane, people that you don't think would make, uh, you know, listen to your podcast or, or anything. Um, people that you would never guess were kind of into the psychedelic movement or anything else right. like that. We're, we're totally open to, to different experience and new things. And I would, I would imagine, yeah, Phil Rizzuto might've been the guy that some people look at as like, Oh yeah, that's a, that's the voice of my childhood listening to Yankees games growing up. Yeah. Um, but he was totally cool with this apparently. Uh, yeah, I mean, he signed up to do it because, I mean, in real life, he's just sounds like he's reading play by play. Um, yeah. But he knew he knew what was the song was about. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see him be all wide eyed and play stupid about like rounding the bases. What was he talking about? <laughs> yeah, how long? I wonder who the first person to ever use baseball as a metaphor for sexual progression was. I know. I was I know, kind of wondering good. maybe did it not come from this? Because it like it seems pretty specific. Like it's literally it's rounding second, headed for home. Like all it. Of... Oh, that's funny. Like what if it yeah, is? If he, what if this yeah, wasn't actually... metaphors back in the fifties? I don't know. I feel like he would deserve more. He well, he obviously would deserve way more credit yeah. for yeah. It than that. I think he. I think that would be way too out there for him to do such an extended metaphor of that if it wasn't already a a metaphor yeah. for yeah. this. I mean, it's like the bulk of the song is yeah. Phil Rizzuto describing the experience. <laughs> I bet there was probably some like 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 sitcom in the 50s or 60s that was the first to do it as as like you say as the extended metaphor it was like literally talking around it yeah and there's, yeah you just definitely know that that eddie haskell is involved was, <laughs> uh, <it> was a <laughs> bad influence sure. of eddie haskell <laughs> this is a big chunk of lyric should we just like let the audience hear this and let me play it or do you want to try to do your announcer voice ben <laughs> i don't want to try to do the announcer voice <laughs> It is the radio progress. Okay, here we go. We got a real pressure cooker going on here. Two down, nobody on, no score. Bottom of the ninth, and there's the wind up, and there it is. A line shot up the middle. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty explicit. I don't think he's talking. They, yeah, they played it on the radio, and it was like, I mean, know exactly what you're talking about. That's so funny. This boy can really, really fly. He's rounding first and really turning it on now. <laughs> <laughs> not letting up at all he's gonna try for second the ball is bobbled out in center and here comes the throw and what a throw he's gonna slide in at first 
Here he comes. He's out. No, wait. Safe. Safe in second. This kid really makes things happen out there. Batter steps up to the plate. Here's the pitch. He's going, and what a jump he's got. He's trying for third. Here's the throw. It's in the dirt. Safe at third. Holy cow. Stolen base. He's taking a pretty deep, big lead out there, almost daring them to pick him off. The pitcher glances over, winds up, and it's bunted. Bunted down the third base line. The suicide squeezes on. Here he comes. Squeeze play. It's going to be close. Here's the throw. Here's the play at the plate. Holy cow. I think he's going to make it. I think he's going to make it. I'll tell you one thing. If he, if he almost came at second, he yeah. wasn't gonna make it home anyway. It yeah. was gonna be he was gonna fake a leg cramp or something and just be like, oh, I, uh, I, 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 we're not ready yet. I respect you too much." Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't bring a condom. Yeah, it's all right. You know, we've all come at second every now and again. <laughs> One of those things that's happened to the best of us, and now yeah. it's happening to you. <laughs> So in the video, in this part, it's funny. It just has the announcer and some clips to like, you know, black and white baseball. And then it clips to um, Meatloaf and the girl on stage, like starting to really make out. I mean, he's like, we're going to make out. And I mean, like you said, Meatloaf's not the best looking guy. And she's kind of cute. And I just, the whole time I'm watching this scene like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah she had carla devito was the one that did it in concert because ellen foley wasn't there for that so but so she would sing it in concert but then they would dub ellen foley's voice over for the video but that um yeah that carla devito had like that real sexy skinny 70s vibe yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know wearing the like the, the, yeah 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 and yeah. she was acting like they were totally doing like broadway stage acting yeah. like really big emotions and everything but it was like when I was listening to the lyrics, I was like, all right, this would pass. I feel like this doesn't get canceled in uh, in, in 2023. No. You're watching the video and uh, Meatloaf was getting pretty aggressive. I think <laughs> the, there was a lot of swatting away by Ellen DeVito before that. I don't think that would necessarily pass the, the censors today. He'll be okay Bro, because there wasn't moment. a pull and push and pull like she wants it. No, I can't. Yes, I do. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Do you think it was that? Like it was more of a, 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 a her negotiating with herself too? The way a girl, a, a virgin, a teenage virgin is like, I totally want this, but I don't want you to think I'm a slut, but I totally want this. Yeah. Wait, and now we're going to get into, she's like, okay, I'm probably about to do this, but yeah. wait, here's what's yeah. going to happen. <laughs> I think today we be problematic in sort of a different direction. I think it would be problematic because the, the girl is presented as like, I'm not going to do this unless it's true love. Like, unless I'm getting married, unless you're going to wife me up, unless you're going to take me away. Like, I think that's too traditional. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. I think that was, like, where's the sex positivity? Where's the woman's choice? Where's the woman's, where's, where's her agency? Where's like, where's her fulfilling her desires? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And she's proposing, it's like the classic, okay, like, all right, I'll make your sex dreams come true, but you got to buy me a house. And that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that isn't like, and ultimately, like, obviously we're overanalyzing it, but like, this is yeah. like, yeah, this is the way it goes, you know, and especially more so, uh, more so then, but still with a lot of kids these days, that's still, you know, depending on how traditional your, your upbringing is um mm. yeah but this, yeah you're right this is the moment though where it was all it was all id beforehand it was all just two people and then all and, but she's realizing like oh crap okay yeah. we gotta yeah. we gotta set mm. some parameters here yeah mm -hmm. i this think is this is where the rubber meets the vagina <laughs> <laughs> possibly i think this is <laughs> less contingent upon paragraph b <laughs> <laughs> this is less cancelable than baby it's cold outside i think i mean sure. He's just mm. like, no, 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 in that song. And he's just like, oh, bye, 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 Who do you think they're going to believe? <laughs> <laughs> Love me forever till you need me. Will you never leave me? Will you make me so happy for the rest of my life? Will you take me away? Will you make me away? Do you love me? The girl says, stop right there. I gotta know right now before we go any further. Do you love me? Will you love me forever? Do you need me? Will you never leave me? Will you make me so happy for the rest of my life? Will you take me away? Will you make me your wife? Yeah. That's yeah. the part where um, I feel like I looked up the because I told you I was, uh, I was I was reading about negotiating tactics at the time. And they, there's like a bunch of big mistakes they make. I feel like uh, this is where it, this is where w number one, we failed to thoroughly prepare to negotiate stepped in <laughs> because I feel like 
I feel like Meatloaf was completely blown blown away by this. Uh, all of a sudden, this objection, like he he didn't realize that this was even on the table. I yeah, like you're front loading the big ask right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get in the video, his face goes into shock, and I'm like, this is. I'm surprised it wasn't a total boner killer. <laughs> I mean, he just. <laughs> but well, he. You know what though, Diane? That's the thing though. Like this is where it was so it's so perfectly presented though too because, I, like that is, like I most guys in like it, in moments where like the horniness has gotten pretty bad. Um, yeah, their their negotiating ability goes way out the window. <laughs> like, they're they're they're, yeah. you're, like, not, yeah, you're not. Yeah. Yeah, you're not intentionally lying. You believe it in the moment, but uh, <laughs> it just makes you do kooky things. And oh, God, that's so horribly <laughs> true. A friend of mine in high school one time said he told a girl he loved her. Um, like she asked him in the middle of a BJ if she, he loved her. <laughs> and he said yes. And then later on, he's like, come on, man. <laughs> Yeah, that's like uh, some kind of extortion or something. Oh, she's the a... worst. She was the yeah. worst. Yeah, and she knew no it. fair timing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ben. I guess that makes sense. I was talking to to a lady who told me that she has that her her kink is is she has a praise kink, and I was like 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 I tried to like take it seriously, but in my head and my whole being, I was just like everybody has a praise kink. Yeah, you can't have a praise kink. Yeah, what's the praise thing? kink? What are you talking about? Everybody likes to be told they're the best. I, yeah. yeah, I'm going to need more information because women get praised all the time. Like, what is mm -hmm. she talking about? Like, is it yeah, for it to raise to the level of kinkiness? Like, does she know what kink actually means? Like, uh, it's, <laughs> she definitely knows what kink means. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It feels like saying, like, my kink is missionary. Uh, <laughs> take it up a bit. Uh. <laughs> no, she's telling me that, like, for her, it's like it's on a different level where it's like, like it's something like it's elemental. Like, it makes her blood run faster or it makes like the, you know, like the physical turn on. It like just, it, like, she just likes to be praised. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I'm wondering if it's a how is that different from anybody else? Like, yeah, I mean, I've been told I've been the best at a certain thing by every guy I've ever been with, and I'm like, I can't be. Like, I think you're just saying this to every girl. <laughs> you, you do have a freakish power, and you'll never know. <laughs> Maybe I do. Maybe I do. That's a freaking pretty cool thing to say. <laughs> that's uh, that's you should. <laughs> Maybe I'm I feel like that really works for Maybe you I in have college. A brag <laughs> fetish. <laughs> a what fetish? Bragging. Oh yeah. <laughs> I used to years ago. I was trying to work on a on a stand up bit about like a, a, a an innocent young girl who loses her virginity to a guy who's into like very kinky stuff. You know, so she just thinks that, like that's just normal now. Yeah. <laughs> the whole life is like, like that's what sex is. Like the next oh. time she's with, it, <laughs> she just and she's with a yeah. new guy who's just trying to make sweet love to her, and he's like, "Oh my god, what are you?" No, doing? no, 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 no. I don't need that. I don't need the no, no, no not the no, not the. I don't need the. I don't need the clothes. I don't need the whips. I don't know. No, I'll put that in my mouth. Yeah. I, I just. I just want to pee on you in the bathtub. That's all I want to do. <laughs> That's all I'm interested in. <laughs> it's like a completely different freak show. This poor girl's like, men are awful. <laughs> yeah, we are. And you got two extreme, <laughs> two extreme access points there. All right. I got to know right now before we go any further. Do you love me? Will you love me forever? And the boy says, Let me sleep on it. Baby, baby, let me sleep on it. Let me sleep on it. I'll give you an answer in the morning. Let me sleep on it. Baby, baby, let me sleep on it. Let me sleep on it. I'll give you an answer in the morning. Let me sleep on it. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, time out. <laughs> that, that, that whole, I've always been intrigued by that though. Like, let me sleep on it. Like, okay, so what's, like how's that gonna how's that gonna move anything along? Like okay, let's just let's uh, let's punt this until tomorrow morning, and then get back down to the business at hand, uh, yeah. which is the very thing that's keeping us from moving forward right now. Yeah, yeah. I don't, uh, it's like the classic. Let's cuddle until you calm down. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's cuddle until basically I don't sleep all night long. And then uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. I'll just go ahead and leave instead. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cuddle past your objections. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> let me sleep on it, baby. Let me sleep on it. Let me sleep on it. I'll give you the answer in the morning and both. Let me sleep on it. Uh, I got it. it it's the, the same, the same uh, verse from the, from the girl. I got to know right now. Do you love me? The boy, let me sleep on it. I got to know right now. Do you love me? Will you love me forever? The boy finally makes the turnaround. I couldn't take it any longer. I was crazy when the feeling came up on me like a tidal wave. Started swearing to my God and on my mother's grave that I would love it till the end of time. I swore I would love it till the end of time. Where he says, I couldn't take it any longer. Lord, I was crazed. And when the feeling came upon me like a tidal wave, I started swearing to my God and on my mother's grave that I would love you till the end of time. I swore I'd love you till the end of time. You know who's uh, talking there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Tell her yes. Just say yes. <laughs> well, and the, the whole thing, though, is too that I believe him. I believe that he believed it at that moment. Okay. Like at that very moment, he 100% believed, like yeah, he sold himself on the picket fence and the kids and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So now I'm praying for the end of time To hurry up and arrive Cause if I gotta spend another minute with you I don't think that I can really survive I'll never break my promise or forget my vow But God only knows what I can do right now I'm praying for the end of time That's all that I can do Praying for the end of time So I can end my time with you now I'm praying for this is this now is we've the, gone to the future. <laughs> this is this is the third act now. This is them bo both singing this, right? They were talking themselves into it. They did the yeah. negotiations, and now they're both saying, "So I'm pr so now I'm praying for the end of time to hurry up and arrive because if I gotta spend another minute with you, I don't think that I could really survive." Like I love the emotional honesty of this song, where it really does take you through the whole journey. Like love is a lot of things. It's impulsive. It's it's fantastic. It's in the moment. It's ethereal, but it's also a decision like it's a thing that you got to live with every yeah. day in your life like it becomes an obligation you know what in uh, you know to kind of speak to what you were talking about earlier ben with uh the, the, from the woman's perspective like yeah it ends up sucking for her too you know mm -hmm. like yeah what you thought was important and so you know the thing that mattered and everything it really it ends up sucking for everybody because you yeah. attach so much important importance to, to that one moment mm-hmm but I mean, attaching that that importance can help you through the tough times. Like, like how many arguments have you guys had with your with your spouses? I know I, with my significant others, there's been plenty of times. Just like, yeah, but do you remember that great moment that we had by the dashboard light? You know, we could <laughs> we could have another one of those if we can just get through whatever bullshit this is. Yeah, <laughs> like, get back to when we like that so much. <laughs> I wonder for the guys sometimes though too. It happens like immediately afterwards. Like yeah. he might have been praying for the end of time. Like he was, he he knew. <laughs> He knew pretty quickly, like, oh boy. Oh. I said, what? What did I agree to? <laughs> what a different world this would be if sex didn't have consequences so often. <laughs> Was that so often? Yeah, it doesn't always. <laughs> As in producing people. And, um, you know, the, the stigma, especially back then, is like, well, if you're doing it, you got to get married. And like, ah, oh, sh yet. Well, yeah, that's where, I mean, imagine like before... I mean, for one, well, really before birth control, like birth control allowed the whole sexual revolution. Yeah. But for, you know, for a few millennia before that, <laughs> there were millions of years before that, it was like, I mean, that's how horny people were. Like that they, A, thought they were totally going to hell for it. And yeah. B, <laughs> totally thought like that they, they, if they got pregnant, like that was it. Yeah. My life is over. We're going to have to get married and there, there's no divorce or anything. Um, that's how horny people actually are. It's pretty, it's pretty astounding and impressive. It's the power of our earthly biology to populate this planet. Like yeah. whatever this force is, is like, we're going to make you do whatever to make more of you <laughs> and populate yeah. this planet. Like make your brain crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like having sex through like uh middle age, like the uh, Europe of the middle ages, sanitary standards. <gasps> uh, there's people who are still having sex, you know, <laughs> one bath a year, but still getting after it. It's just... Yeah. Uh, I was talking was to Corbin the other day. Off. Sorry, Ben, I feel like I keep cutting you off. Um, I was just talking about like, when did deodorant become available? It was 
1800s at the earliest i don't know I that they use like natural scents and stuff but yeah that come on we've all used those crystals they don't work uh <laughs> when i um when i run up against like back home when i'm out at like i might be at a walmart or something and there's like amish and mennonite people mm -hmm. nearby and they're like they got you know they're all working very physical jobs and i don't think that i think they bathe more like it's the 1800s mm -hmm. um <laughs> i think they get a pretty good sometimes waft mm -hmm. of what life is like and i think that they just don't obviously like you know notice it because it's all it, everybody's the same that has to be it because i was like this earth was populated on the stinkiest sex and i have to imagine when everyone's in the vortex of it you don't smell it yeah yeah well, so plus anytime, also, you, anytime you get sad or lonely, just remind yourself that you're living in an age of, of great smelling sex. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so, of course, this is the best smelling sex any generation has ever had. That's that's probably true, um, <laughs> especially and it's like the most hairless sex, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I remember I remember when I uh, my dad, my dad and his one of his wives had a copy of the the joy of sex like the original yeah. version yeah in 1970 yeah. i remember my brother and my stepbrother and i somehow found where they hit it and i can remember even then like even though it would have been normal and everything looking at these pictures and being like that's a lot of hair man <laughs> like i don't know if i'm ready to i don't know if i'm ready to go there if there's that much hair involved I don't know. oh i know we're animals <laughs> 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 they look like wolverines. It was uh, it's scary. <laughs> but sometimes with things shaven, I'm like, I don't know, is that better? Do we need to see all that that well? <laughs> some of these girls, you got some baboons. <laughs> well, that's all, yeah, but again, that's I think I, I think most I don't know Ben about you, but like I remember like as a, as a teenage boy or whenever you first start looking at magazines, like the more graphic ones. Because if like yeah. Playboy, you wouldn't see much, but every now and then somebody would sneak in a hustler or something. Oh, know, I was yeah. the, the first time I saw like the hardcore stuff. I was I was traumatized. Like, yeah, I, I, like, yeah. That's, you're like that's really what it is. That's like it. It scared me honestly. But it's kind of like uh, I mean, it's kind of like liquor. Like you have enough good experiences with it, and all of a sudden it takes on a beauty of its own. You know, it's <laughs> repulsive at first, but it's, it's got a payoff. But now you really start to understand it a little better. <laughs> <laughs> See it through new eyes. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll never break my promise or forget my vow, but God only knows what I can do right now. I'm praying for the end of time. It's all that I can do. Ooh, ooh. Praying for the end of time so that I can end my time with you. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. did you guys see Forty Year Old Virgin? Yeah. I mean, no, I'm sorry. This is Forty with Paul Rudd and um, bits and pieces of it. I didn't see the whole thing. So <laughs> they're fighting the whole time. They're both turning forty, and their relationship is getting hard. They're a married couple. They have kids, and they keep fighting. And there's this great scene where Paul Rudd is in the car with his two daughters, and he's eating like a McDonald's breakfast sandwich, which he's not supposed to be eating, and uh, he's singing this song with every this last verse about how much he doesn't want to be with this woman anymore but every fiber of his being and his kids are just staring at him and then the little girl in the back's like how many of those are you gonna eat i'm gonna tell mom <laughs> and then he's like snitches end up in ditches and he's just like <laughs> like singing this song <laughs> As many as I want. I'm gonna tell mom on you. Try it. See what you get for Christmas. Nothing. It's really good. That's awesome. Yeah, that's Definitely. funny. I walked through. Uh, I went through a uh, when we were living in Jacksonville Beach. I was, I was done. I was done playing, and I was trying to keep my weight in check. My weight was kind of getting out of control when I was done uh, in the NFL for a little while. And um, and my wife thought I was doing a pretty good job with my diet. From one day. <laughs> My mom was visiting, so we went through the McDonald's um, drive through It was just down the road from us. And we pull up, and the nice old lady that was working the, uh, working the drive through was like, you want your usual three Egg McMuffins, Seth? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my, my wife looked at me, she's like, how does she know your name and your order? And that was, uh, yeah, that was my this is... 33 moment oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome though we were like lady shh, got my family in the car this is our <laughs> secret 
<laughs> I have that too, but instead of the McDonald's drive through it's the bar. And instead of egg McMuffins, it's shots of Jack Daniels. <laughs> you want your usual three shots? I do, yes. I do. Line them up. <laughs> My new girl, by the way, that I'm bringing. <laughs> Good to just let her know. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah. Yeah. It was long ago, and it was so far. It was long ago, and it was far away, and it was so much better than it is today. And the girl repeats until the end. It never felt so good. It never felt so right. And we were glowing like the metal on the edge of a knife. And that's that's kind of you know. sad when you read it like that. Yeah. Instead of man, yeah, and they're kind of discussing what their life has become. Yeah, was good, that was a good reading at the end there by Ben. It actually that actually moved me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I feel genuinely sad for those people now. I was well, trying yeah. to get very like Sir Ian McKellen with it. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go check out Ben at Grown Up Storytime. Uh, <laughs> apparently, he reads these stories, and uh, you got to make someone feel feel it. Ben, good. Uh, a, that show is so much fun to do. The funnest fact that I learned about Meatloaf was that he was in high school. His his mother sang in a in a church choir, and she always used to tell him like like you can't carry a, a song, you can't carry a tune in a bucket. You'll never be a singer. He's an athlete, like he was a he was a football player, he was a very big, strong guy. So he's like on the football field or track and field or whatever. He gets hit with a 12-pound shot putt in the head. He got yeah. run with a 12-pound shot putt in a horrible track and field accident. But the upshot was after that, all of a sudden he had a three and a half octave voice. Whoa. Really? Yeah, like it did it, it did something in his in his brain that that let his body know that he was capable of doing this sort of thing. Oh my gosh, that's like something from a movie. Like the kid that like gets kicked in the head and it turns him smart. Yeah. He got bit and by a spider of- and now he's Spider-Man. <laughs> like come on. <laughs> like hit me in the head with the shot put. I want to sing so bad. In exactly the right spot. It's going to be very, we're going to have to try it over and over and over again, Diane. You might end up with all different kinds of people powers that you don't even want. That might have been, that was like a one in a million head injury though, huh? That just really. You're either going to learn how to be a great singer or you're going to kill your wife. <laughs> like you know, It's a gamble. <laughs> go either way. But apparently there were, there were moments throughout his career. Like when I say moments, I mean like, like periods of like, like six months or, or a year or longer where he would lose the ability to sing. Just like what, how, like the, the confidence would, would go away or something would occur in his life, something would stress him out. And he would be like, his uh, uh, Steinman, his longtime writing partner would say like, there were times where he would be in the studio for months and it would sound like a dinosaur dying. Like it was really? just terrible. He just could not sing. He would have to go to therapy every single day to try to talk himself back into it. And eventually he would come back to his usual self. But yeah, something happened in his brain that he, he has to, like seek it out. He has to stay dialed in or he can't do the meatloaf thing. You're oh, giving goodness. me this really messed up hope now that I can sing. I just have to unlock the blockage in my brain. And this is gonna this is gonna make for some really bad nights of karaoke, Ben. <laughs> no, we can't. If you've got a voice you can do. Oh, that's the other thing I was thinking when I was going. Like this is the go-to karaoke song of the most annoying couple you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, like, that, you know, oh, yeah. Well, that we're gonna do paradise for the best for like I'm gonna go have a cigarette. Gonna, right. yeah. <laughs> it's really long too, right? So yeah, it's eight minutes of them up there. Oh, oh. Yeah, doing eight, the, eight, have you ever seen buddy anybody actually do the makeout scene and everything? <laughs> oh no, absolutely not. <laughs> I might actually stay for that. <laughs> <laughs> Getting their praise kink on. Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 Karaoke can be boring when it's just a bunch of people who are actually good at singing. I'm like, show me the train wrecks. That is what I'm here for. Like somebody that's bad, but sells it or like commits. Oh, like they just completely commit in. to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm there for. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, sometimes you go in there and it's just a bunch of people who are professional showing off. I'm like, this is boring. <laughs> I don't like that. You know what, this. Diane, though? Maybe you need just a little bit of, um, have you ever tried like a voice coach or anything to no, voice I lessons? Because I can Do sing it. a little, but then yeah. you know, I freak out because it's not, I'm not Adele. I'm like, my voice cracks and I'm like, it's over. I can't do it. (laughs) Yeah. But like, think about just remember Bob Dylan or anybody like that. It's, you know, you've got, you you know what you have more than a lot of people, uh, more than the vast majority of people. You know what every guy has told me I have. Okay. (laughs) No, you <laughs> like you've actually stood up on stage and had to try to form connections with people. Right. And like that's a hard thing to do. And right. like actually the the singing doesn't matter nearly as much as actually forming a connection with people. So right. if you could probably improve your singing a little bit and then lean into your other skills, 
not whatever you were talking about, but your singing <laughs> skills. And uh, you, like, you probably have way more ability than you than you think or give yourself credit for. All right, mm -hmm. Seth, when I start torturing people, uh, they're all going to blame you. <laughs> you gave <laughs> that vote of confidence. <laughs> I've known a couple of people that have gone to see voice coaches and they say that it, like, it, it does wonders for your confidence. Like yeah. just, just knowing that you can hit these notes every now and again just makes you walk a little taller and feel so much better about yourself. Because that's the thing is I can every now and then. I'll be in my car and I'll be like, I did it. I did it. Yep. And then I can't do it again. Yeah. Well, that's, I, was, so, like, I don't like speaking in public kind of kind of scares me, but I, I can do it. You know, it's like it's, I've learned to kind of handle that fear. If I had to sing honestly, like I can do karaoke because it's a joke. But if I had to sing honestly in public, that would terrify the shit out of me. That would be I, I would find that really, really difficult. I don't know if I could overcome the performance anxiety to do it. Yeah, you see why like Jim Morrison just got drunk out of his mind to do it, you know, because <laughs> yeah. he was so, 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 so nervous about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Because especially too, if you're trying to form that connection with Diane, because now I'm envisioning you kind of as a crooner almost like that's how you'll set yourself apart. Like, the, hey, um, uh, what's what her want? name there? The, uh, the, the, uh, the rehab one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Amy. <Winehouse. laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah. that takes, then you're bearing your soul to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so do you have more meatloaf facts? I do not have meatloaf facts. Okay. I am done with meatloaf facts. Um, so I was going to say the, so we usually have Jeremy on to do six degrees of, uh, the clash and in the research, I found out that Ellen Foley, the woman who sings on this was dating Mick Jones from the clash. And he oh. wrote, should I stay or should I go now about her? So really, that's our connection to the clash. Easy. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. That's that, wild? that was easy. Yeah. That was, a, that was the other thing too, where I realized like, uh, um, that meatloaf had all these connections. to like, uh, well, what's his name? Steve, uh, from the, from the E street band. Um, oh, the, yeah. And Bruce Springsteen, like two guys from the E street band played on this song. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And like, he had a lot of respect from producers and everything that just mm -hmm. recognized he was doing something different and unique. Some people were saying that, like, dude, you just you guys don't know how the hell to write rock music where other people thought it was really, um, really something. It was, yeah. it, was, it was probably probably polarizing back in the day. Yeah, I would imagine songwriters probably feel like really hemmed in by the radio and the way that music has to be delivered. Like, it's got to be three and a half minutes long. It's got to be verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge. You know, like I would imagine that the that, 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 that guys like Meatloaf, the really inventive guys, they come out of that. We're just like, I'm not going to fucking play to the formula. Like I'm making a nine minute rock opera. Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's if where it Skinner takes, you know can... what? I'm sorry, what time? No, I just said if Skinner can do it, like, why not? Yeah. And that's where like, you're right. Because back then it was, man, only so many people got a chance. You had to impress a producer or something. So probably him and his ability to like be, be touring as... I think it was Jim Belushi's understudy at one point on a touring yeah. show. Um, yeah. Like the ability good. to actually make a living doing something else allows you to take some of those risks because you're just saying like, no, oh, I'm going to make this thing and we're going to keep shopping it around. But in the meantime, I've got a gig. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, 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 all I have to do is show up at the Broadway theater at seven o'clock every night and do my show. I've got my whole day free to compose these operas. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. The best art comes out of like truly not giving a shit about the rules and doing what you're, what you want to do. Mm -hmm. see it all the uh, time very few people did it any better than meatloaf i thought the connection like the quick clash connection you were going to make was just like joe strummer or that meatloaf is just joe strummer in a fat suit like you heard <laughs> <laughs> sorry to break your hearts everybody <laughs> how did uh how did it get to be six degrees of the clash well so jeremy is another comedian friend he's a retired comedian now but uh he has been a friend of the show forever and he used to have a radio show back in i don't know if it was st louis where he would do it like kind of live on the air six degrees of um who's the replacements guy the first guy tommy uh tommy stinson and that was like a thing that he would do so we decided he's a to have super him high level mu music geek like he knows the names of everybody who's been in the band all the producers like like it's just it's crazy how many, like and it's encyclopedic it's just lined oh, wow. up and organized in his head like he's yeah. just he's just record store guy to the yeah. nth degree yeah so he can do like six degrees of the clash in his head a lot of times and just, well it started and with really tommy stinson and that was all and then he got kind of tired of connecting everybody so he's like let's change it up so then he did it to a group called tinted windows which was like a super group of like someone from hansen and some other bands 
And so once we started 2023, he's like, I want a new one. Let's come up with a new one. And I was like, well, let's go with our namesake and do the clash. So now currently he's doing the clash and he'll probably change it up again. Yep. That's um the, the, uh, like the punk in general has always fascinated me just because it's, it almost feels like, I, you know, cause it, punk slash like when we were when i was in high school at least like the skater kids were kind of like the uh the, the the rebellious ones in uh and i always felt like a weird kind of uh like disconnect i always felt like whatever the the clicks are in high school i always felt like the skater kids were actually at the top in a lot of ways because they yeah. just didn't give a damn you know and like you knew they're like just with like with punk kids they're looking down on everybody like they yeah. like mm -hmm. kind of flipped everything i was always fascinated by like punk and their ability to just flat out say like not only to the jocks or like the preps or anything like that but the actual music people too like nah, yeah. fuck off yeah, yeah. We're, we're, yeah we're punk yeah i really think that they're that the skate culture is really good for kids because it makes them fearless. Like it makes them willing to, to try just about anything. It's an yeah. incredibly competitive little culture that you've got to, you've got to navigate and survive. Yeah. And it, does, it does you very well. Uh, Diane's husband's a very successful guy. He was very much a skater kid when we were in high school together. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that, I went and to he still has a mohawk. So. Oh, does he? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, no, because I went to a small enough high school that like we all and it was K through 12. So like we all knew each other. So it wasn't like you see in the movies or anything like that. Guy, people kind of separated and everything. But you're right about the the fearlessness part. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. that was the kid. The, the kids at my school that were skaters were like you just couldn't but you couldn't help but be impressed by the ballsiness of it. You know, mm -hmm. like in the in the broken bones. It's just it's yeah. badass. <laughs> yeah. I hung out. I hung out with like, I was, a by it. Yeah. I was the I it, it was I mean I liked punk music but I was more like new wave and stuff but I hung out with those kids but I also had you know I was a cheerleader before that and I also had friends that were still preppy and the difference is and you can see it more as an adult is the punk and new wave kids were not people pleasers and they were not insecure. And the thing about like my friends that were the more preppy, like stay with the click thing is it came from blazing insecurity because they were too afraid to not blend in because they yeah. didn't know who they were. These punk kids, they're like, I don't give a fuck who you think I, you know, but at the same time, they had their own click. Like if you weren't wearing the same Stussy shirt or the baggy pants, like you were doing your own click as well, you know? Yeah, you had your yeah. own skills. Yeah. Really, it's, it's all tribal you gotta yeah. like you gotta conform to some tribe at some point and the, yeah. yeah like the really genuinely original ones were like the shy like the poet types that were off in the corner and everything yeah the yeah. ali sheedy in um <laughs> yeah exactly like the truly original people yeah i'm so glad to hear you say that because i was the weepy kid writing poems in the corner <laughs> oh no it's yeah dude that's you were just balls. you were the canadian that moved to texas and was like i don't know how to I don't know how to, I don't know how to goofball with you guys anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> oh, to hold up within myself for a few years. <laughs> you know what, Ben? I bet though too. Okay, uh, how old are you? Forty-three. Forty-three. Okay, so like this is one thing I think. Was it hard for you if you grew up in Canada around that time? You're probably a Kids in the Hall fan. Oh yeah, yeah, very yeah. much. So. so like, dude, the further south you go in America, the less yeah. appealing. Like people just watch Kids in the Hall and they're like, what? What the? What, what is this? What, yeah, yeah, what, <laughs> was it supposed to be comedy? Like, uh, <laughs> so when you go from like that kind of like crazy, weird, doesn't make any sense, and that's what's funny about it, to yeah. uh, to Houston, it was probably it was probably a huge shock in a lot of ways, just from a for a kid that's a funny kid, right? Like it didn't necessarily hit quite the same way. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know how to be funny anymore. I didn't know how to be entertaining because, like, like my I would open my mouth and my accent would be would be funny. <laughs> Just like, like yeah. I, obviously, I said a after everything. I didn't realize it was after every single sentence, but I stopped that like on day two of, of, of high school. In America. Oh, <laughs> bullying is so effective. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really That's the best form of motivation. <laughs> yeah. When people make fun of Madonna and her fake English accent, I'm just like, move to England. You will have a fake English accent in four days. I fucking guarantee. <laughs> they just start uh, making cracks about the dumb American as soon as you start piping up. Or, yeah. Uh... yeah, it's not called, TV, in. it's called telly. It's not your apartment. It's your flat. Like, if you want to be understood, you change your language. Like, oh, you language. yeah. Well, you yeah, know, it's funny. Yeah, you actually like the actual. I always forget about that, that the actual vocabulary really is different for so many common things. You got to adopt it somewhat. Yeah, yeah and like then it's a, probably easy to just start okay well i'm just gonna start doing the accent too like it's just yeah. close 
Well, you know, you're talking about uh, kids in the hall, like the further south you go and not getting it. There's a, an opposite with that with King of the Hill. The more north you go, they don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I didn't get King of the Hill until I lived in Texas. And yes. I was like, oh. <laughs> like, and I started identifying people by the character and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's an episode of King of the Hill where they go to they go to like a New Orleans plantation. And it's like my favorite half hour episode of TV ever. <laughs> and every time I watch it, all I can think about is how like you have to be from Houston or New Orleans. Otherwise, this isn't nearly like you have you no idea. How funny <laughs> it is. Yeah, you won't get it. It's just the two cool. groups of weird people with weird accents and weird ideas clashing. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Um, all right, let's keep this going. This is my favorite part when we have a guest. Uh, Seth, do you have a guilty pleasure song? Yes. Uh, I had to talk to my wife about this for a little bit, and we settled in on uh, Gangnam Style. <laughs> I'm not like a dance in the car type of guy. I'm more like I'll fist bump and stuff or whatever, but like Gangnam style, I'll start dancing like in the car, in public. Like if I, if my child is around to embarrass my child for sure. I, and I have no embarrassment about it whatsoever. This, that stuff is engineered in a lab to mm -hmm. appeal to you. And that's just like, I'm genetically programmed to dance to that thing. <laughs> yeah, I remember when that song came out, my friend got married. And so, you know, if you got married during that time, it was played at your wedding and everyone did the dance. And I remember her in her wedding dress doing the <laughs> dance. And I was like, it, it's, it's got me. I'm smiling. I'm having a good time. I like it. <laughs> We probably need to do that song. I, I think I've got this. I may have the story. I don't know. But Gangnam is, is like it's like a neighborhood in a, in a city in Korea, right? Yeah, it's like, a, like the ultra exclusive, um, uh, like Rodeo Drive type of place, I think, right? Yeah, or so like the, in Beverly Hills. Yeah. Yeah, the song is making fun of this very elite community, right? Of this tiny community, in Korea, but it's all over the world. Like, what an effective diss track that is. Like, yeah, you know, yeah no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine a Houston rapper, like, like, like writing a diss track about Kingwood, and then it becomes <laughs> like, like a worldwide phenomenon. Like, <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> It yeah. could happen. Get on I, it, Travis. That's a great one. Do you also <laughs> yeah. like like the Macarena? <laughs> like, you, know, you know what? The Macarena came. We were talking about that, the Macarena, and then kind of from that same time period. The song that I'm surprised, maybe I just don't I that I'm surprised I don't hear this song more just randomly that was huge in 1996 or seven is the thong song. Oh yeah. Because yeah. that still thong, pops thong, into thong, my thong. head at times. And it's just <laughs> not I'm like, do you still hear it anywhere? No. But okay, I don't hear new music. We have a music podcast and I know nothing about current music because I'm like, where do people hear music anymore? Because when I drive my car, I'm listening to podcasts. When I'm home, I don't have like top 40 radio going and yeah. MTV doesn't exist anymore. How do people hear music anymore? New stuff. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, the algorithm, I guess, delivers it to the kids. <laughs> they just, I don't know, whichever like social media circles they're in, it, it gets around that way. Yeah, because I don't even know how, like, some of these, like, some of these things that I like now, like uh, Passenger or Lumineers or anything, yeah. I have no idea how that started. It just started getting somewhere along the way. I got identified as a singer songwriter enjoyer and it like yeah. started piping into my apps, I guess. Yeah. You have, you have to do more work. I feel these days you have to go seek it out where it used to just get you. It used to hit you. It's yeah. The only thing to do at work. I'm a, I'm a bartender is to, is to search Spotify for like to dread, like dust off old bangers and see how, see how the kids will react to that. I found a couple of, of, of weird ones uh, the, the Tina Turner song, uh, we don't need another hero is yeah. a feminist banger that just lights the room on fire with oh. like, oh, I totally forgot how great this song is. Yeah. And then the other one I did last week, I was surprised at the good reception it got, but uh, Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me from the Batman Forever soundtrack by U2 lit the place on fire as really? well. Really? Really? Yeah, because yeah. They, were, they, were, they were able to get over like U2's corny and old and dad music, but because this is tied to the Batman soundtrack, it made it just kitschy enough to be appealing, I think. Oh, yes. almost like like the old uh, Batman TV series. It's exactly. like, uh, yeah. it kind of like a little bit had yeah. the West vibe to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I hate this, but I also kind of love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, is there any, is there like an artist in general that like people like, maybe it's not a huge surprise, but that like Zoomers actually enjoy the most? It's not 
in I'm, kind of, I'm kind of surprised at all the love that, that Dolly Parton gets. Like obviously like it makes it makes sense, but I'm kind of surprised at like like how how passionate young people are about Dolly. Like they're really yeah. <laughs> I wonder if that is that is part of it just because they've seen her in interviews and stuff and like she's just such a cool old chick. Yeah. I also because I think I think she's a crossover persona, you know, where like yeah. as the politics and the culture gets so ugly, like here's Dolly who can do, do obviously is a hero, you know, to into red state America and Southern America and everything like that. But she's just a solidly decent person who doesn't right. line up. She's a pure love. You yeah. Can't- you can't hate her or Betty White. I mean, people who are just pure love with that little sweet singing voice and like she's dressed like a dra- drag queen. I mean, she's just appealing everywhere. Yeah. yeah, you're somebody who just tried to do nothing but pump good into the world. So I think yeah. I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of respect for somebody like that because yeah. it's refreshing. That, that generation is just below us. You kind of forget what a weird and shitty, ugly world they've grown up in. Like they don't, they don't really, you know when you hear things like make America great again, like that can appeal to me, like as I'm getting older, like, yeah, it was better then, but for different reasons, you know, like it becomes like this nebulous slidey thing. And I always have to remember when I'm talking to somebody who's like 22 years old, like they never grew, like they grew up in, they, they grew up in a country at war, you know, constantly at war, you know, constantly yeah. at war with itself. And just in these constant, ugly, shitty arguments, they get bullied online. You know, they post pictures of themselves. Like, it's just the world that they live in is so much nastier than the one that I grew up in. Like I, it, I kind of, my heart goes out to them when I see them seeking out sweet things. Yeah. The, the level of, yeah, the level of nastiness that they see yeah. it used to be at least confined to like maybe the school day and then you could get away from it or, but and then, yeah. I mean, you, you went home to a shitty home perhaps, but like, at least you could hopefully get away from that even. Yeah. But now it's just, yeah, if you got a smartphone, it's, it's at any point, 24 seven, they can, they can. It's constantly with you. you. Yeah. They yeah. can find you any damn time they want. It's, it's gotta be just terrifying. I would have hated to be on Instagram or Facebook in high school. Hated it. Oh, Oh, it would have been a nightmare. People, oh, they hurt. They're out to hurt your feelings, teenagers, mm-hmm. all the time. And then to have constant access to you to do that. What a nightmare. Yeah. My uh, my sister works with kids. And um, so she tutors kids. And a lot of them have learning disabilities or they're, uh, you know, maybe on the spectrum mm-hmm. or, or what have you. But, but and, and also with other kids too, she works with just kids that are good students and are trying to get better, all that. So she sees a pretty broad array of kids. But she said the one thing, that seems very, very different is like the, like the inability to interact in person with others. Like, obviously she's got some of her students are like, that's their diagnosis is they have a hard time. But with some of her, her regular students, she said, because she sees them outside of school where it's like a different environment. And then when they like, even when they're the, the students are like one is leaving and one is coming in, they like, don't know how to interact with each other yeah, you know yeah. she's out with her daughter and she sees a classmate and her daughters and both of the kids are kind of like don't know how to interact with each other if they're not in a in a formal environment that yeah. um because they're always you know. my my friend is a school teacher he teaches like eighth grade science so 13 year olds and he says that because of the pandemic he's basically he has a classroom full of 13 year olds who are effectively 11 year olds like they just they haven't they've, they've missed two years of, of social development yeah that's so right I get actually annoyed because I'm, I'm a little more um, extroverted than some people, but I mean, there's there's like introvert, extrovert, but like, I get really annoyed at that meme that goes around. It's like, oh, another office meeting that could have been an email. And I'm like, do you not understand how important it is to talk to each other with their face, especially if you're like brainstorming ideas, like you guys are crippling yourselves with this you have got to learn to talk to each other and i shook a teenager's hand a few years ago and it made me furious she melted (laughs) as if how dare i touch her and i was like you need to learn some life skills this sucks like you people suck i thought thought you were gonna say you shook a teenager (laughs) (laughs) go girl (laughs) wait ben what's it like okay because this is the other thing i've heard too is that a lot of zoomers like have no idea what it's like to actually uh, like approach or hit on a person in person because it's all on apps now. Yeah. Do you see that in the bar? Yeah, I do see it, but like, like they, like I'm, I'm old. Like I stay out of it. Like they, they have their own rules. You know, like yeah. if, if there's a problem, you know, if somebody starts like a fight or something like that, then I'll intervene. But like I don't. They, they do their own thing. But it's, is it so? Like, do you, can you sense at all that it's not like the same? 
like a guys le- are guys more reluctant to just approach a girl you know that they don't know or or anything like they're, that. They're, they're do it in a in a in a in a much more healthy fashion, at least in the places oh, really? I work at. Mo- most of the time, like you still see you still see a lot of like the you know the hammerheads, the guys who just don't get it, who still have like the cat calls or the like the creepy pickup line. Or the one that I see most often that I that I hate the most is the guy who will just sit down directly next to a lady and then just not say a word, just just like just right on the oh. bar stool, but just like. Well, well, I'm not bothering her. She's not bothering me. Anybody can say, okay, yeah, but that's not how you do that. <laughs> I want her with logic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I definitely see like, like they, they can, they, cause they have their own language, you know, their own online language. I'm, I'm just going to sound like an old man. I am an old man. Fucking fine. But they have their own vocabulary, their own language, their own, their own ability to, to relate to each other and their own, their own way that they send one another signals. And it, it, it seems to go a hell of a lot better than it did for me when I was that age. Really? Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I mean, they have to figure it out. As much as we do online, eventually you have to be in person. You have to figure that out. Mm. Yeah. They are like having less point. sex than we did. I have heard that. Yeah. Is they that bad? They're having yeah, like, sex though. Like when I'll, I'll, I'll listen, to, like listening on conversations, I'll be like, "You're 22 years old. You should not be doing that." No, but, you don't <laughs> have to do that yet. <laughs> just the way it is should be perfectly fine for you. <laughs> that doesn't have to be on the menu ever. Quit making that a priority. Exactly. Yeah. As you get older and more bored and more specific, that those things come up. It's too yes. soon. Yes. Put some things away for later. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, yeah, yeah. They're they. It's like they're trying to throw everything in the gumbo pot. And you're like, no, 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 no. You're oh god, you're going to be celibate by the time you're 25. Do not do that. Exactly. Just the meatloaf and potatoes for you. <laughs> all right. Until you're in your mid 30s. <laughs> I've often found that uh, urging moderation upon young upon youngsters works out very works. well. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go to that party and have one drink <laughs> think about how that would work if i literally leaned over and just be like have you tried having less wild sex yeah. have you thought about that <laughs> as i as i look back on the advice that i now try to dole out that i totally ignored when i was yeah. a kid. <laughs> they're like have you seen our appetite though why wouldn't we just eat it all right now I'm gonna be fine. have it your way yeah is that meatloaf? I think we meatloafed it. That's meatloaf. All right, Seth, this has been great. And uh, I think we could keep talking for another hour, but uh, let's have the listeners who are not your usual listeners find out where they can see and hear more of you. Promote yourself. Uh, I do a morning radio show with Sean Pendergast on Sports Radio 610 AM from 6 to 10 AM on weekdays in Houston. And uh, also my YouTube channel, which I started up like two months ago and I'm having a blast on, which yeah. is uh, just search Seth Payne on YouTube and I'm one of like three Seth Paynes. Uh, the, my channel is the one that looks like me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty, I got the SEO going pretty well. I'm like 18 out of 20 results when Seth Payne comes up. So we're good. All right. <laughs> I was the only Diane Cups, and then I was the only Diane Gallagher until this hot ass news reporter out of South Carolina, I mean, North Carolina showed up on the scene and I get a lot of tweets directed at her that should not be directed at me. <laughs> you got to just start advertising your special skill. I know. See if she, uh, <laughs> she <doesn't... laughs> direct challenge yeah. yeah i know i know i'm so glad i mentioned that on this episode <laughs> by the way <laughs> no th- th- we'll give you the guy treatment like it'll, it'll come up every uh it'll come up once a year for the next 27 years yeah. all right all right <laughs> well seth this was so fun thank you so much for coming on the show this was actually a very very so- fun song to talk about yeah really, thank you really I'm, uh, I'm, I'm i'm glad you guys had me thank you very much all right and uh What's that beeping sound? Oh, is that Ben? And uh, uh, check out Seth on Twitter. He's very funny. That's how we found each other. So yeah. Oh yeah, at Seth C. Payne. Seth C. Payne. Yeah, yes. fine. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was lovely having you. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. All right, guys. Thanks, man. We he was a lot of fun. That was great. I knew that was gonna be fun. Yeah. Um. All right. So next week we <laughs> is that your beeping? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Next week, we teased this uh, in the episode before this, so we were like, let's go for it. We're going to do some murder ballads. Yes. Um, And we talked about having Jeremy on, so maybe we can bring Jeremy back on, too, and uh, it'll be three of us. It won't be a typical episode. We're going to do about a dozen murder ballads, so we're not going to read you a dozen 
song lyrics. Um, we're not going to go through that. We're just going to talk about murder ballads in general, their history, and why I love them so damn much. Yeah, really fun. Yeah. All right, we did it. And Vogue. Thank you, Seth. That was a lot of fun. Rock the Cash Bar is produced by Diane Gallagher. Music by Chuck Savage and Eddie Hawkins. Special thank you to Jeremy Essig for Six Degrees and to Sarah Wessling for the guilty pleasures of vocals. Our website is rockthecashbarpodcast.com and there you can find links to our Spotify playlist and to our Patreon. Thank you for tuning in and we will see you next week. <laughs>